Welcome back to the channel and welcome to what is very much likely the final Leagues of Voltan competitive event analysis video of the year. Uh, and so to make this one a little bit special, we're going to examine a Leagues of Voltan placing at a very unique type of competitive event. Before we begin, you'll be happy to hear, literally, that I fixed the audio issue and you should now be able to hear me on both sides of your head. On today's agenda, that's right, we'll be examining the three-day super major event consisting of seven games held at the Coventry Super Major in November 2023. As always, we'll be examining the Voltan's placings for a quick overview of the matchups and the scores earned, as well as where he made it in the standings. We're then going to jump into the list analysis. We're going to discuss some strengths and weaknesses, and then we'll contextualize the results of those placings. Jumping into the Coventry Super Major 3-day event held on November 10th to 12th, 2023, we see the list for exam today was piloted by Danny Porter, who went 5th place out of 146 players with a 7 wins, 1 loss standing. Matchups of the days included Votan versus Tau with an 85 to 68 win, Votan versus Astra Militarum with a 94 to 56 victory, Votan versus World Eaters at a 97 to 60 lead. 84 to 66 victory for Voltan against Chaos Space Marines, which might seem surprising as we'll see later on. Voltan versus Eldari, 87 to 78, another surprising victory. A Voltan defeat of 36 points, the Chaos Space Marines victory of 100 points. Voltan with an 82 win against World Eaters at 68. And lastly, Voltan with an 87 point victory against Eldari at 77. Right off the bat, some of you might be a little shocked or surprised to see the results of some of these scores. I know I certainly was, particularly with the Eldari, which we will touch upon later in the video. Let's take a look at the list and contextualize some of those matchups. Starting things off, we have two Ionir champions, each leading the unit of 10 Ionir Hearthguard. Uh, both loadouts here for the Hearthguard are identical. We got the Hisir running the Concussion Hammer, which is mathematically better than any of the two options they could equip. We have nine Ironir Hearthguard, each with the Concussion Gauntlets, Grenade Launchers, and equipped with Vulcanite Disintegrators here. So obviously we're really fishing for those Dev Wounds. We really want to utilize our Sustained Hits to Stratagems, just get as much value as we can out of a unit like this, which is why the Ironir Champion is likely the one accompanying these units over a call. Because what we want here is we don't want to negate the Devastating Wounds that come out of these. We actually want to support it. By that, I mean running a call you get lethal hits, but the lethal hits kind of take away from your devastating wounds because then there are fewer wound rolls that are made since some of your hits go straight through. I feel like overall, it's not that much of a difference in terms of damage output, but I do feel like the Ironier Champion is just overall a better complement to the Vulcanite Disintegrator squad that's being run. You get to reroll the charge, which is amazing coming out of Deep Strike, obviously. Um, and then on top of that, you get the mortal wounds on the charge, which it's very small, but it does have an impact. And honestly, it's roughly equivalent to the lethal hits you'd probably get anyway with the cowl. Now, for designing your champions, you got one of them that has the mass hammer, and the other was running the Dark Star Axe. So really more of a uh, anti-tank uh, weapon versus uh, an anti-elite or infantry weapon. And I honestly, I think I'm leaning towards running this in my list as well, uh, one of both. I feel like the in my experience so far, and I'm gonna make a video about this, but in my experience so far, I feel like the mass hammer has just disappointed me. But I, I do understand that it has good potential to pop off and really do some serious damage. So I, I would run one, but I also find that maybe for consistency, sometimes I, I just wish I had that consistent output that would be provided with a Dark Star Axe. You might be thinking to yourself, why run one of both? Um, and especially if your Hearthguard squads are both running gauntlets, wouldn't it be better to run um, the anti-elite um, uh, extra hits uh, with the accompanying Hearthguard that are also running plasma gauntlets instead? And sure, you could make an argument for that, but my understanding from looking at this list is that the pilot wasn't really going for a dedicated anti-melee infantry unit with these Hearthguard, because it's kind of losing value. With the heart guard, your shooting is more than sufficient to take out any infantry that you might want to kill. And with the devastating wounds and being at strength five, I honestly feel like you have pretty good play into elites as well, um, just with your shooting. 
So really, you're using these guys to pick up any other uh, models in melee. You really want to just shoot with them as a priority. And if you have to go into melee, sure, you do a lot of damage, but you're, you're using these to shoot. And so by bringing a Dark Star Axe, all you're doing is simply providing an extra layer to this unit. You're providing the option of having that ability to play into something that might have survived the shooting by chance. It also allows for uh, specific scenarios to play out where let's say you bring the squad down and you have to kill three different units that are in front of you. So you put all your shooting into, or half your shooting into one, uh, maybe you charge the other two. And so because of that, you have to split the tax on the hearth guard. And maybe you won't have enough to kill just objectively because they're only packing two attacks each. And so with this Ironer Champion here with the Dark Star Axe, you do get that extra reliability of being able to clear the units you're trying to go for, so long as obviously they aren't um, anything super tough, which would be for the other Ironer Champion to take care of instead. You'll notice there also aren't any enhancements taken in this list, which may seem strange at first, but honestly, I, I feel like while our enhancements are all pretty good, like most of them do have play, they aren't essential or, or required or mandatory to run in the list in order to play well, um, especially if you build your list around not really needing one. And, and I'll explain that in a bit as we get towards the pioneers here. Uh, but really, is there really much value that's added when you're already dishing out four judgment tokens uh, at the beginning of the, of the game and you know what your priority targets are, you know what you need to be killing, and you have these big blocky units that are going in with the sole purpose of killing these major threats and anything else that might not necessarily be judged. Moving along, we have two squads of 10 Hearthkin Warriors. I really love these guys. I say this in every video, but I really do feel like two is the ideal number of, of units that you want. You really want two squads of 10. Um, and the reason for that is honestly just the sticky objectives. There's so much value in having that simply because you can park it on an objective, you sticky it. Let's say your opponent kills you. They deep strike in your deployment zone, you're dead. But now what? They can't charge on the objective. And on top of that, you own it. So being able to split these guys up in their Sagittars and basically just send out waves of sticking objectives across the board is, is monumental in gaining momentum in the game and just longevity as well. You'll notice that these warriors are also equipped with uh, the Ion Blasters. I really like the Ion Blasters too. I, I think just generally the extra AP is really helpful. Um, and they're also equipped with the Kin Melee weapons. So for the Kin Melee weapons, I I actually do think that it's it might be better than the shooting because if you're using these guys to sticky objectives, most of the time, you're going to be behind ruins. You're going to be in cover. Um, you won't be able to be shot, but you will be able to be charged. So let's say something runs in and it charges you. Um, and, and like, even if three guys survive out of your five-man squad, or like one guy survives, he has the melee weapon. He'll be able to do something. He'll be able to stand his ground and, and maybe pick up a guy or two just by chance. I'm starting to lean towards um, thinking that if you don't intend on using your warriors to shoot, which you probably shouldn't because while they have interesting guns and loadouts, I don't think any of them are necessarily um, game-breaking in terms of what you're going to be able to achieve with them. So I, I think playing it safe, you can't really go wrong with the melee weapons, just getting that extra damage in, in a realistic scenario that will likely occur with them being charged or being in combat. So next up, we have two squads of five Berserks. And so these Berserks are running Concussion Mauls uh, across the board. They got a Mole Grenade Launcher because it's free. And they're also running one Gauntlet. I'm not a big fan of the Gauntlets. I actually feel like, just even numerically, they don't do as much as the Concussion Maul. Um, and, and so with these guys, you're really just using them as a quick blender. It's a trading piece, right? Like, something comes to you, you can use these defensively to counter charge. You can use them to kind of protect the backfield. You can use them to trade a units that your hearth guard come down and there's less of a threat for them. And so I feel with these, you either want to commit fully to having the concussion malls so that you're able to clear out any elite threats, or you want to commit to running one squad or two, maybe one with the axes, just so that you have the capacity to clear hordes that might be in the way. So I'm not too sure how the gauntlets played out here in these matchups, but I, I would totally be curious to hear uh, from the pilot how he felt they performed. 
So just jumping back to the hearth guard here, I didn't mention it, but obviously these are in deep strike. Um, there's no hecaton to transport them. There's minimal value in starting them on the board because, um, I mean, really you're slow, right? You only have five inch move. Once you land or you start somewhere, you're never going to get out of that area. So these are more than likely always going to be in deep strike, unless maybe in the world leaders matchups, if you feel confident that you could stay far back enough that you could withstand the initial charge and then you could walk in and uh, and clean them out. Uh, but likely they'll be in deep strike and you'll be using rapid ingress to come down uh, at the end of your opponent's movement phase so that you could quickly walk out. Skipping ahead to the Sagittars real quick. Um, so we're running five in this list. And obviously everybody knows Sagittars are one of the best units in the index. Um, there's no doubt about it. They're fast, they're durable, um, they're, they shoot pretty well, um, they're flexible, and they get to transport, which is really good because you're basically transporting your sticky objectives to the place they need to be at. And it, it gives you some redundancy with staying power because somebody shoots your Sagittar, they finally kill it, and then out pop your Hardkin Warriors who are sticking the objective or honestly maybe even charging into whatever small um, skirmish unit is there trying to take it because now you have kin melee weapons. So uh, there's just obviously a lot of value. There's not much to say about the Sagittars um, other than the fact that the pilot here went for all high last beam cannons. I mentioned this in another video. Um, I think obviously the more Sagittars you have, uh, the more variance you can kind of negate and, um, and give yourself more consistent damage output by running the high last beam cannons. Because they're so variable, you want to have a lot of them to average out the damage you'll be doing in case one does only one and then the other one does six. Well, now look at that. You did a lot more than one, but a little bit less than six. Um, so obviously, the more you take, the better it is if you're going to run the high last beam cannon. I'm, I'm personally torn between the high last and the missile launcher. Um, I got to try it this weekend, uh, both versions, and I, I honestly am not sure what I prefer. There's really just like a bad feeling when you roll the high last beam cannon, you don't get sustained, and then you roll like a one for damage. It just really feels bad. But then conversely, if you roll with the missiles and you get a bunch of sixes in those rolls, you're going to be punching yourself in the face, right? Um, because there was no reason for you not to take the high last. So I don't know. I, I'm really torn. Um, I'm curious to see what the pilot thinks about them, if he wishes he had taken something more um, reliable over the Sagittarius, or if the high beams are just really the best option in a list like this. Last but not least, we get to the Pioneers. Um, just honestly, a really solid unit. The pilot's running two squads of six. Um, this is really not something you see every day. Super unique. And the reason for that is because typically Pioneers have two purposes, typically. You're either going to keep them to score, so you'll hold them back a turn, maybe two, and then once you've dwindled down your opponent or they've overcommitted somewhere, you use the Pioneers to very quickly, either through their ability or through their moves, to get from one end of the table to the other through strategic reserves, which is obviously great, right? Like it's super fast, it's super flexible. That's typically one instance of the Pioneers. The second instance you'll see is using them to essentially uh, bomb rush your opponent, turn one, with their scout move and then their move. You use these turn one to try to kill one of the targets that you judgment token. So when you have your four tokens, you're gonna to typically put three of them out on these really big threats, and then you'll put one on something really cheap and easy to kill. Why? Because if you kill it turn one, you get three command points. So using your 90 point pioneers to trade for three command points is honestly, it's, it's pretty good value because it allows you to just amplify the damage you do because you know your hearth guard are reliant on sustained hits too you have a lot of potent stratagems like adding ap to melee weapons which like think about that just applying that to your hearth and warriors who have kin melee weapons suddenly these guys are kind of scary and honestly for for a 90 point unit it does a lot of shooting so those are typically the two instances you'll see scoring or early pressure and this is is kind of completely out of left field. Um, instead, we have two bricks of six pioneers. And it's no longer this early game quick trading piece, though it still could for 180 points. But what this looks like to me is that you send it in, you pop sustained hits two on this, and you absolutely rinse something. 
And it, it could be a, a big threat target too. Like these, these guys are a pain to deal with. Can you imagine if you keep one of these six-man pioneers back until mid-late game, and then you pull it out once you've dealt with the biggest threats that could impact them, and then this six-man squad is running around the board just gunning down any infantry that remains on your opponent's team, going from one objective to the next. It could be absolutely devastating. And when we look at the matchups, we're going to try to examine that and see how these pioneers might have played into certain games and how beneficial it could have been for having these two six-man bricks. Overall, this to me was the most interesting part of the list and why I wanted to talk about it today. I think it's super cool and unique and uh, something that if I had models for, I would definitely want to try out. All right, moving on to the strengths and weaknesses of a list like this. I think that a list like this is very punishing. It's super oppressive. Um, essentially, what you're doing is you, you're having these excellent mobile units go across the board. Um, you're very quick. You do a lot of damage because everything is grouped up. So you've essentially doubled down on the amount of units you're bringing. There's a good redundancy here, right? There's a lot of two of everything. Um, and so what you're doing is you bring these, either these really fast, aggressive bikes out, which absolutely butcher any infantry that's on the board, or you could bring out your hearthkin and, and absolutely slaughter any elites or even uh, any vehicles that might be present with fishing for devastating wounds. And, and overall, what this leads to is a very cagey play style. You're honestly trying to trap your opponent because Voltan want to be in the midboard. The midboard is great. We have mid-range weapons. We're pretty durable. And we only win if we're in the middle of the board because we have fewer inches to move to get to one end or the other since we're already in the middle. And, and so getting to the middle as Voltan successfully and staying there is really good uh, and contingent on us winning most of the time. And so by having a cagey list like this that essentially punishes your opponent for coming to the middle of the table or trying to is really good. Just imagine having uh, your Hearthkin Pioneer running across the side of the board, knocking out anything that's running towards your Hearthkin to kill them or anything that's trying to shoot at your Hearthkin that could threaten them trying to get into position. You pop the, the Pioneers out. Maybe you pop a Strat on them for sustained hits too. And you, they're already a two judgment token, the enemy. So whatever you shoot at them, it's probably going to go through. And that's a lot of wounds that they're going to have to save, even if they're a high toughness. So I think there's just a lot of play here uh, with the roster that you have. Even if these uh, pioneers are, you know, contextually better against infantry, I think because you group them up, suddenly you do have play into anything stronger than that as well. So like I said, just overall very punishing, it's oppressive, good mobility, very cagey list, which I like a lot. You make your opponent make a mistake, you make your opponent get agitated and come towards you, you play around them, you stage well, and then you go in. All about staging with a list like this. Um, you're also really strong into elite and light infantry, as I mentioned. It's a really good, reliable mission play too. Basically, by that, I mean five Sagittars, transporting sticky objective units, transporting berserkers if you need them to, because you do have that flexibility, right? Let's say in one game, you can afford to not send out an extra infantry squad and you want to send out berserkers instead, do it. Or maybe you want to send two berserker squads out, do it. Or maybe you know your opponent is playing the aggressor and he's going to be coming to your backfield. Okay, keep your berserkers there, send out all the infantry forward. I think, honestly, you got really good mission play in, in a list like this, good secondary scoring as well, and, and honestly, it's just very unique. I feel like not a lot of, besides the Sagittarius, not a lot of opponents would be used to playing against a list like this that runs double squads of six-man bikes. It's just really cool to see. And in addition to being cool to see, I think it means your opponent could make mistakes because they don't know how much damage they might need to do to commit to killing the bikes. They don't know how much damage the bikes will be able to do in return. I really think something like this, mind games, like I mentioned in the last video, is also really important to optimize your chances of winning. Giving your opponent difficult decisions, things that they're unsure of, anything that'll make them hesitate or maybe make a mistake. And then with your KG list, you capitalize on that and punish them. Just really strong, and I, I really do think that there are a lot of strengths here um, that are very obvious to look at. For weaknesses, this was a little bit harder. I, I had a tough time finding some weaknesses here. Um, some of them are more certain than others. I do think transparently you got a lot of clear threats. Um, if your opponent recognizes these threats, they're going to know exactly what they need to kill. And this means that as a result of that, 
you're sort of a pseudo elite army now this is a pseudo elite roster in that you got a lot of stuff but your threats are just big units so it's very easy to say oh okay these things there's four of them and they all look like they could kill me um i'll try to kill these first and if they do mm, you're gonna have a tough time so on that note i i do wonder if a list like this is kind of terrain dependent you know more so than others obviously everybody's dependent on terrain but i would say more so than others because you need to stage with your bikes and you can't afford to lose these or trade them too early otherwise you lose a lot of efficiency out of them uh, and so maybe you're looking for tables that have a lot more terrain on them or maybe you're more negatively impacted if there's less terrain available this one here is more of a, a question more so than a weakness but i'm just wondering looking at a list like this like what's the trading sequence because obviously you could put the berserkers in to bait out a unit and then you trade it and then maybe your hearth can come down uh, your hearth guard come down and they try to kill them uh, but i'm just wondering typically like what would you be doing what are you looking for early game to set yourself up to trade uh, and get a good success out of a list like this and clearly the pilot did because he played very well I'd be super curious to hear what his thought process is going into a game, what he's looking at, what he's thinking about trying to do and achieve. All right, with that done, uh, let's take a moment here and quickly go through some of the matchups. Uh, there are seven, so I'll go through these pretty quick because the video is already quite long. And uh, we'll contextualize, try to examine and see uh, why this list performed the way it did. Kicking things off with the towel game here, uh, we do see it was an 85 to 68 victory for Voltan. Um, I, I would like to think that Voltan in general play pretty well into Tau. I, I think it's a pretty good matchup. It's favorable to us, uh, mainly because Tau has typically uh, a few big units that are threats. They got their crisis suit bombs that are coming down and either some kind of vehicle or they're running breachers or something like that. So I, I think it's quite easy. And obviously breachers would absolutely get destroyed uh, by a list like this. So if they are running breachers, that's not great. Um, I think another really key strength of this list into Tau is that typically you'll have to trade your Hearthguard unit into the Crisis Suits. So you'll lose a lot there, but you'll end up killing the unit. However, I think with this list, you can actually trade your Pioneers into the Crisis Suits and probably do really well into it as well. So it's like a 180 point unit and you're going to be able to get back like 300 points, which is really good. So in general, I think careful positioning here with the terrain, as I mentioned before, uh, in, the, in the potential weaknesses, uh, but playing around terrain, playing KG, and waiting for the Tau player to commit to your midboard or your backfield, and then sending in the bikes to retaliate quickly or rapid ingressing the, the hearth guard if you need to, to clean up the squad, I think is really key here in this game. And obviously, Voltan did really well here and ended up pulling the victory against Tau. Voltan versus Astro Militarum. I think this is also okay for Voltan too. Um, it, it depends a lot on what the Astro Militarum player is running. So you can see a few different archetypes with Astro Militarum. There's either heavy infantry, or and so they just keep like regenerating their infantry squads from reserves, uh, or there's also just like the, the mech heavy lists. I think either or. Voltan does well, but I think Voltan might typically struggle into the all infantry list. But with the inclusion of two six man bike squads, I think you actually are favored in that matchup quite significantly. Just being able to bring your squad in and reliably pick up as many units as you can shoot because you're constantly wounding on twos basically all the time if they have a judgment token. And for the most part, even if they don't, since you're running high lies. I think it's a really good matchup into T3, which is what we see here. And these bikes do some serious work. I think all in all, uh, if Voltan's able to get to the midboard without dying, which they could because they obviously have deep strike and the bikes are really fast, and so are the Sagittars, they have great staging here in this game, and they'll be able to hold it against Ashton Miltarm with the capacity to be able to overextend your bikes and kill whatever threats might be coming your way. Voltan versus World Eaters. Um, so there's two matchups of this that happened, and so I guess I'll just quickly touch upon how I think both of them went down since they were very similar outcomes. Uh, so much so that we see for World Eaters, uh, they were both in the 60s range, and with Voltan, uh, two different scorings, obviously, uh, but I think overall we can expect that they're quite similar lists, uh, especially with the, uh, the dominant archetype now of running Angron and uh, as many Exalted as you can. 
So with something like this, I again feel like Voltan is just really good at the World Eaters, but I actually think it's a really fun matchup. I think in something like this, the World Eaters are super aggressive, and if they can successfully navigate the board to get to you without losing their army, I think that they actually are quite punishing. One of your saving graces here, however, is that besides the very initial onslaught that World Eaters get with the pregame moves uh, and just the quick mobility, they have no real threat into your very quick bikes. And so I'd imagine the Voltan player had um, a pretty good game here if he was able to keep his bikes alive past turn two, because then he was able to just basically free reign, drive around the board, picking up uh, any infantry that he sees. So honestly, I, I do think Voltan have a very strong matchup here into World Eaters, but I think it's still a very fun game overall. Next up, we see Voltan versus Chaos Space Marines. This happens twice in the event. Uh, the first one's a victory of 84 to 66, and the second one is quite a drastic loss of 36 to 100. I don't have access to the Chaos Space Marine lists, unfortunately, but historically, we know that Voltan does struggle into Chaos Space Marines. Chaos Space Marines are a really oppressive army. They have great data sheets, a little bit undercosted, uh, and they're just really strong and effective if played right. I think unlike the world leaders that came before it, this army has really strong play into killing your bikes. And that might be problematic because like I said with the weaknesses here, you have very clear threats. And if your opponent is able to not necessarily outplay you, but maybe just outposition your mobility and kill the bikes or even the hearthguard squads, you lose all your trading potential. And if you lose your trading potential, you've lost key pieces, which means overall you're going to be on the back foot. And if you don't have a strong enough early lead, I think you're going to struggle to catch up. Uh, and so maybe with this time, who knows, maybe Voltan got first turn here, they were able to get the objectives and sticky them and just have more of that longevity to get through the game while they're getting peppered down by Chaos Space Marines. It was still a pretty close game uh, overall, but I, I do think that early game lead here was probably what Voltan had to take the win. The Eldari matchup surprised me. I, I was always under the impression that Eldari were really good into Voltan because they just they simply outrange us. Um, it's difficult to get shots on them when they could fade away. And uh, overall, they're, they're quite durable. I mean, sure, we have sustained hits, but I, I don't think sustained hits do much when uh, you're able to essentially autosave uh, rolls that go through. So um, I, I really always thought that this was a difficult matchup for Voltan on paper. And seeing it here as two wins, when I, and I put a picture here on the screen for you to look at, seeing this as a Voltan victory against Eldari, when the Eldari player throughout the course of the event almost consistently scored 100 points in every game, is really, really interesting to me. I wish I had access to the Eldari list, so I was able to look at this in a little bit more detail, uh, but I would imagine the thing that really helped Voltan here is honestly the Pioneers. I think just having a unit of, of six bikes that you could apply sustained hits to to bring them out and just essentially pepper anything down that you have your judgment tokens on to hit on threes, to wound on twos or threes, and just absolutely dominate early like that. I feel like with Eldari, again, like you're playing KG, but as soon as you have an opportunity, I think you have to go all in. You need to commit to them and you need to take out as much of the board as you can. And so with these bikes, you get to do really good staging and you set yourself up for that. Maybe you could bait uh, a fade away with the, uh, the Sagittar shots. And then because people underestimate how much the bikes could do and aren't used to playing in squads of six, the bikes come out and they're able to kill whatever moved. Could be a very interesting game to look at. Um, I'm curious if you guys have any ideas how this might've gone down. Please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to read that. Now, I did mention the Kale Space Marine game before. This is another one. Uh, that was a 36 loss to 100. So two things on this. I think firstly, you can expect Chaos Space Marine to mostly win against Voltan, so I'm not too surprised about that. Uh, however, the discrepancy in the scores compared to that first time is really indicative of something major happening. Either there's a completely different structure in the list for Chaos Space Marines here, which it could be, but I kind of doubt it, or the terrain was different, or maybe Voltan had either first or second turn, which really did not benefit them as it did in the first time they played Chaos Space Marines. I would love to hear from the player on this as to what happened this game, uh, just because of that stark contrast in scores from their first matchup in the Chaos Space Marines. If I had to guess, however, what went down, I would assume that he was unable to catch up from an early game uh, disadvantage, and I think that the Chaos Space Marine player 
likely was able to kill uh, the bike squads early somehow. Either kill the bikes or kill the hearth guard, kill something that really hindered the ability for his units to catch up or do anything. So basically the Voltan player was unable to play KG because they probably lost that key piece early that would allow them to stage properly for late game. Overall, again, I'd love to hear more about this game. If anybody has any ideas what happened, please let me know. Moving along, we have another World Eaters victory. I'm not going to go too much into this one. I think it's pretty much the same as the first, considering that the scores are very much similar. Um, you know, Angron, again, you got a lot of answers for Angron with a list like this. The Hearthguard with devastating wounds, bikes with sustained hits. I really think you force Angron to take a lot of wounds here. Um, I also think that you have a reliable answer to any infantry that is thrown at you because you survive the blunt of it and then you shoot back and wipe them. And then as long as your bikes survive, I think you have a very solid victory here, simply because this list allows you to outmaneuver your opponent. The final game of the event was a victory against Eldari. Again, like I said before, I'm a little bit surprised, but the scores are so similar that I would imagine that it was very much a replica of what happened the first time around. Just good staging, baiting, caginess, and being able to commit at the right time to do as much damage as possible with your units. Now, I will say, I focused a lot on the bikes, and that's because I, I really do think that they were pivotal to the list success here. Just from looking at it on paper, I would wager that a lot of opponents weren't prepared to deal with a unit like this because they simply haven't practiced playing into it. And I think that it's very surprising once you realize the sheer output these things can do and the reliability of it when a judgment token is applied to that target. I'm just really impressed by the pioneers and the idea of running them as the six-man blob that's instead of a scorer or an early threat, it's actually just a key unit in your army, in your roster, that's going to be something that lasts on the board and is going to be a major threat to your opponent. I just think it's a really creative way of implementing new threats um, to lists that, that your opponents might have had uh, prior experience playing against in different iterations, but never in this new version that you created now. Uh, taking people by surprise, trying something new and crazy. Um, and obviously, you know, Sagittars are Sagittars, they're going to be in every list. But I think something like this with the Pioneers really stands out, and clearly it worked pretty well. That said, I'm not at all taking away from the rest of the list because obviously, like we all know, Sagittars do work. And five of them with high last, that's some really good reliability, some really strong output and mobility. And I think that this allows you to really get wherever you need to go on the board, score all your secondaries, contest primary very well, and just be a nuisance and an absolute threat to any vehicles that are on the table. Overall, really solid list. Clearly, uh, the, the pilot knew what he was doing. Uh, he had good practice with this. I think he had a clear vision of what he wanted. He took a risk with the bikes and he made something really unique work. Honestly, I have to say a, a three-day, eight-game event is insane. And mad props to being able to consistently pilot that list um, through all the pressure of the, the mental endurance and physical endurance that it takes to be able to stay focused in, in games like this and be able to pull ahead with such very clear victories. So a huge congratulations to the player for taking this list and securing fifth place out of the event. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone who's going to be seeing this this weekend. And uh, just want to let you know, I have a lot of plans in store for the new year, especially once we hit 100 subscribers. At the 100 subscriber mark, I'm going to reveal a new channel idea that I think would be a lot of fun and uh, really look forward to sharing this one with you. So please, guys, if you haven't already, hit that like button. Please subscribe to the channel. And I'll catch you all in the new year.